Hello and welcome to the Self Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Tyne, and I am here with my friend and co host, Malcolm Owen Flood. How are you, Malcolm? Hey, buddy. I am great. Happy to be talking music with you today. How are you, man? <laughs> I'm doing good. Sorry, I have to laugh because you know you guys don't know this, but we are recording two episodes in a row, and Malcolm was really, really struggling. And I totally like feel for you, Malcolm. Like you, you've had a rough couple of weeks and not enough sleep and all of that. So it's it's really hard to do this um, to do this today. And you and I just looking at your tired face it made me laugh. Made me laugh. <laughs> I'm like forcing Look a at, smile. Like I'm happy yeah. and I am excited to be here. But I yeah. like I from the listener's point of view, I got yeah. like probably a total of eight hours over three days, um, three like intense work days of for sleep. Like just getting like two hours one night, two hours another night. <laughs> and and yeah. Uh, yeah. Heavy, heavy workload. Not recommended. Don't do this to yourself. Don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, guys, please, please, please forgive us and forgive Malcolm if you're noticing a lack of energy in these these two episodes. We're doing our best. I was just, I, I just had to bring it up because when I asked you how you are, and then you're like, I'm good, and I'm excited to talk music today. <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> in my head, it sounds better. Um. Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, I'm sure it does. No, all good. So, I'm, honestly, I'm really, really glad. Um, I didn't even say it last week, but I'm really, really, really glad you're back and we're doing this again. Um, I was able to to do some other episodes in the meantime, so we haven't missed one. But it's really, really good to be back and doing these these again with you. So I appreciate you taking the time, despite you being so exhausted at the moment. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm I'm really excited to be back too. I I was like any moment I could, I was going onto Facebook to try and check out the community and stuff and keep a tab on there. But I, yeah, it's it's been hard to stay plugged into it. Um, so super glad you were able to keep things going while I was away. And uh, thanks to everybody who's been listening and engaging in the community and learning. It's awesome. Yeah, we got lots of good cool. stuff coming up. Yes, I was about to say. So two things um, before we start. The first thing is we're about, I, I don't say, I can't give you any of the details yet, but we're uh, starting soon with the second edition of the Mixes Unpack series that we did. So a couple of, um, yeah, some of you already got the first one. Now we're working on the second one. It's a mixing course. It's mixing walkthroughs. And the second one is in the works and will be out pretty soon by the time this episode airs. I don't think it will be long before you have it and uh, or you have the ability to to get access to it. So that's the first thing. Mixes Unpacked Volume 2 is coming. And the second thing is I am currently still taking coaching students, basically, coaching clients. So what that means is I am giving away free calls still. So you can go to the selfrecordingband.com slash call and just book a free feedback call with me. And you can get a personal feedback on your productions. You can get a roadmap to help you release exciting sounding music consistently. We'll talk about where you are, where you want to go, and whether or not I can help you get there. I'm trying to help you on the spot, of course, but it's also sort of a discovery call to see if I can really, really help you. And I'm only taking on students that I can really, really help. Um, I think I've got, I don't know, 16 or 17 people in the program already. So there's a couple of slots left, but honestly, not too many at this point before I need to change things about the program because I can only serve so many people while still mixing full time. So if you want to get in there or learn about how the program works, I highly recommend you book one of these calls. And again, it's the selfrecordingband.com slash call, and we can jump on a free coaching call together. Awesome. Yeah, yeah do it. And you're going to have questions for them by the end of this episode, I guarantee. So it's a <laughs> yeah. perfect timing. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah I, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah, again, um, basically picking it up from where we left last week, we were talking about mix bus processing, mix bus chains. Um, we talked to you, we explained to you what a mix bus chain could look like, what that actually is, what the difference is between that and mastering, how you should um, approach mix bus processing, what to avoid, all those things. We talked about that. We gave you starting points. So this week, we're going to give you actual examples. This week, we're going to walk you through our mix bus chains, the stuff that we use on our mix bus, and the thought process behind the thing we're using there. So if you haven't listened to last week's episode yet, I'd say you should probably stop now. You should pause now, go back, listen to the episode, and then come back Definitely. because we're not going to explain all the all the things again that we already explained last week. So this is a good yeah, um, good. Yeah, just pause, go back, listen, and then come back and then listen to this episode because this is um, us getting into the details of our own mix bus chains and giving you the walkthrough through those. Why we're doing this, because we've actually explained it all pretty well last week, I, I hope so at least. Why we're doing this is because 
Malcolm and I both mix into these chains for good reasons, I think. And we've definitely, at least I have, made some mistakes or maybe not so great decisions uh, before we arrived at the chains that we use now. And we want to help you avoid those same mistakes. And we want to share exactly why we use what we use today. So you had some, if you listened to last week's episode, you had some time to experiment and build your own chains. And now you're going to, you can compare that to what we do. And we try our best to explain why we do those things. So let's go. Here are the exact plugins and tools we use, the order we use them in, <laughs> how we use them, depending on the mix we're working on. And I'm actually curious to hear, Malcolm, if there is such a thing as a mix bus chain that you always use with a certain order, or if this if this thing doesn't even exist in your template. Yeah, it's funny because uh, we're doing this episode after I was away for a month working away from mixing. <laughs> so I'm like, what What do I do? What? <laughs> um, but I, I, I would say there's probably like four things that, uh, four or five things that always come up. I've always got an EQ. I've always got a bus compressor. And uh, I honestly, I always do have a clipper of some kind. And then I've always got a limiter. And... We did talk about how we are recommending leaving the limiter out of the picture for our listeners, but really we're talking about our chains today um, specifically, so the limiter is going to be part of the conversation. So should I? How, how deep should I go here, Benny? Should I just start at the top and, and, and talk about exact plugins and, and what I'm doing with them usually? Yeah, I'd, I'd say uh, give us a, a walkthrough through your chain, uh, why okay. you use them and, and how you use them or whatever comes to mind, whatever sure. might be helpful. All right. So first up is going to be an EQ. And the the moves that are always engaged is a, a low and high pass. And I'm usually like 20K up is gone. Um, and then uh, my like default um, template has 20 hertz and below gone. And I, but that gets moved around as, as I kind of build the, the low end of the mix and just find that little sweet spot somewhere between 20 and 30 Hertz is kind of where it lands. And then there is often a, a very broad high shelf coming into play. And, and that's, that's kind of like, that's often it for, for the EQ. Okay. Um, I, I, I do find getting a little bit of a cohesive shine there is, is nice using a high boost there, um, opposed to doing it on individual elements in the mix earlier, which is also happening. <laughs> um, I, I find that something something nice happens there, like a linear EQ uh, boost, essentially, on, on the top mm -hmm. end. I, I, I really like that. But that's not to say there couldn't be some low-end stuff happening and there couldn't be some mid-carving happening. But I have found that over time, I've stopped carving stuff out there because if there's something that needs to be carved out, it's probably a more of an individual instrument group issue than a whole mm. mix issue. So I stopped scooping stuff out of the, out of my mixes because it was kind of getting smiley facey. And I'm I'm in love with mids these days. So <laughs> I like keeping yeah. them around. Uh, so so that's kind of the Q move. Fab Filter Pro Q is the plugin that we mention all the time. That's my weapon of choice there. Um, oh, really? And then I'm going into a, a bus compressor and uh, that is usually the, I think it's called the townhouse compressor or is it Townsend? Yeah. I, no, townhouse. I can't remember. Townhouse, townhouse. compressor. Yeah. Um, it's plug-in alliance. Great, great bus compressor. That or their Vertico bus compressor is also great. I like them both so much. And, and that's, there's a lot of stuff happening here. That's again, like our kind of push and pull of the whole mix. Um, and it's deciding how, like the transients of our, our two loudest elements, the kick and snare, are are hitting. A lot is happening there. The only kind of advanced thing I touch on here is that I've introduced an instrument mix bus before my vocals. So there's like instrument, vocals, and then a mix bus. And I've actually kind of moved my primary mix bus up onto that instrumental one. Um, and oh, if you okay. remember on our last episode, we talked about fighting your mix bus pro processing. And mm -hmm. the, by moving that primary bus compressor to the instrumental stem rather than the whole mix, it, it means that my vocals aren't getting pushed around by it if I'm really slamming that compressor there. Yeah. And uh, and it lets me get like attack times a little faster if I want to make it more aggressive and pumpy. So so that's kind of what's happening there. But even if I'm doing something pumpy on that instrumental bus, there's still going to be one on my mix bus that's a, a slower attack, fast release, and it's kind of just a like more transparent leveling compressor happening there, doing doing even less probably. 
after that is kind of where we get into loudness. Um, and there's going to be some clipping happening there. There is one called Newfangled Saturate that I, I like for that. Um, mm -hmm. You can just kind of control the, the curve of the, the clipping. And then uh, it, the Sonics Inflator is the other one, which just sounds great, but you can't really tell what's happening very easily. Uh, mm -hmm. I That's one of those magic plugins that people say, just slap it on and it's good. But I'm convinced that they're just making, they're just turning up the mix sometimes without actually using it. <laughs> so uh, a lot of experimentation, a lot of volume matching has to happen there to make sure you actually like it. And then FabFilter Pro Q, or for, sorry, FabFilter Pro L is my mastering limiter of choice. And that's the last thing in my chain. So you kind of master as you mix into the... Like, I sure that, do. Um, and again, we recommended that you that you don't, uh, yeah. especially while learning. But yeah, it comes in... Uh, once I've got drums, bass, and guitars in, I'm going to introduce uh, a limiter to see what happens right then and there kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And yeah. I don't push it hard until later, but um, I, I get real interested in what's going to happen if I want to make this loud pretty early into the process. And th that's just uh, a preference thing. And there's a lot of people that like to do that, but there's a lot of people that don't. Um, like you said, Benny, you've kind of stopped. Um, so yeah. there, there's not a right or a wrong there, but I'm just kind of like constantly yeah. checking, is this going to uh, let me push it as loud as I want it? Yeah. Yeah. If you're hired to do the mix and mastering, you can definitely do it that way for sure. Yeah. I just I did it for like that for a long time, and I, I I maybe go back to that. I just for now I stopped doing that and and try to separate the mastering process. But it also it's kind of hard, honestly. Yeah, I don't want to get into that too too much for now. But like, yeah, you can totally do that. And I think a good reason for what you're doing there is that you just all you do is when you mix and master, you try to make whatever you're working on sound as good as it can possibly sound, and that like in the mixing and mastering. So it's kind of one one thing that you do. And so you are, since you are one person and you can't really separate the mixing and mastering too well, like too well, because, you know, you just do whatever you need to do in order to make it great. You can sort of build it into this one process. I just think it's pretty dangerous. It can be pretty dangerous. And it's just, I just think of mastering now as a different mindset, a different set of, of, of things to do and, and, and problems to solve and tools to use, which is very, very hard if you mix the song yourself. So yeah, you, I, I, so in my opinion, you either have to really be able to to separate the two and and, and make sure you really as as objective and fresh and and with a little bit of break in between, or you do it right away as you mix because then it just becomes this one process of making things sound really good and also loud. So this is perfectly um, perfectly fine. I think the worst thing would be to mix it then. And then in the same session, sort of master it afterwards without thinking about the mastering in the mix. So if, if you do that separately, mm. I would definitely make it real separate in a separate session a couple of days later. But uh, if you do it in one go, I would say make it is make it part of the mix like you do. I think there's it's actually actually yeah. a good idea. Yeah, yeah, it's just every decision I make is with the with the intention yeah. of the song being finished. Yeah. There's no like yeah. oh I'm doing this like, because I know later I'll do this. You know, it's like yeah. like this is just how I want it to sound. There. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And yeah, we don't recommend it because it's just so, there's so many moving parts and everything affects everything. And it's so easy to overlook something, to miss something and to to screw something up without even knowing. So yeah, we talked about that last week. So interesting, cool. That's, so actually it's just, it's a fairly simple mix bus chain, I'd say. You have the broad sort of EQ, you have a compressor um, and you have your, your clipping and limiting for the the volume and maybe how hard, depending on how hard you hit the clipper, the clipper and, the, and the compressor gives you the character vibe that you want. And then you do the yeah. trick where you exclude the vocals from your mix bus so that you can push it harder and um, you can sort of make the vocals sit on top of that more without pumping with the music too much. And I assume sometimes yep. maybe you would want the vocal to be to be to gel more with the music. And in that case, you'd route totally. it into the mix bus probably. So that that could also yep. be something you want. But if you wanted to to sit on top of the mix um, more, then you can you can do the trick that you said. So sort of bypassing the mix bus processing with the vocal. Or yeah, adding exactly. another another like subtle compression to to glue them back together, as you said. So that would be the most advanced yes. move to just make the instrumental pump and and then get that vibe right. Then add the vocal on top and then make it gel with another compressor, sort of. Yeah, yeah. If you grabbed my mixes unpacked module um, with with future there, that's exactly what I did. We have a very yeah. pumpy song, and uh, but we had to get the vocals still glued in there. 
Um, at least I'm pretty sure that's what I did on that song. <laughs> I need to rewatch my own video now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but yeah, and now so that's EQ, the compression, clipping, and a, a limiter. There might be multiple instances of those things happening. Like I might have that uh, an EQ at the beginning of the chain, but there might be one after the clipper again. Um, so like things have kind of gotten changed by the, like the compression and stuff and clipping and I want to like bring some life back in there or something that can happen for sure and one thing I did leave out that I actually use all the time is uh some kind of it's, it's gonna sound funny but some kind of AI EQ um <laughs> we we mm -hmm. strictly talked about how I don't like using AI mastering things but this is kind of different um there's either soothe which is like a, a subtractive EQ and and I find that that can do a better job at picking out like harsh resonances than any other tool. And then there's Golfos, which is both subtractive and additive. And they're they're just faster than you can be. So they're it's not that they're mastering the song for me, but they are. And you you can learn how to kind of dial them, uh, either attacking or adding to certain frequency ranges in a way that no other tool that I have can do. Yeah. Um, and maybe making things more even and static, um, which can be useful. And and yeah. it's also kind of a loudness tool as well. Yeah, totally. And I'm not against using any of those AI tools, not at all. I think technology has come so far, we should take advantage of that. And as you say, these, as you said, these dynamic EQs, which is basically what basically what they are, they can make faster decisions than they, they are faster than you, which means you'd have to autom you'd have to manually automate all kinds of EQ bands in order to achieve a similar thing, which is almost impossible and, and it's it is impossible to do it is impossible yeah. yeah so it's something we can do that we couldn't do um, a couple of years ago and it's a good thing that we can do that now um, and it's not a those tools are not bad as as everything you can abuse them and make your mix worse with them but you can also definitely improve your mixes if used correctly and i also think that there is um i think it's true that there is some sort of frequency balance for most genres that most people just enjoy that most people just like that this is just a fact it's not the same for for every like across all genres so a hip hop mix will sound will have different uh, you know will have a different frequency balance than a, a metal mix but in general within a certain genre there are certain things that most people like and certain things that most people don't like there is a certain quality to the top end that we just enjoy and there is a certain harshness that most people don't enjoy and there is a certain there's a tight low end and then there is a muddy or woofy low end that we don't like and if you right. know these things and if you think about that it's, it's actually it just makes sense that these tools exist and that you should also use them because they they do that for you basically they they carve out a little bit of that with harshness and they add a little bit of sheen and they make the low end a little bit bigger but without it being muddy and you know Art is subjective and we shouldn't like AI will will hopefully I don't I don't think AI will ever replace any anybody in the in the arts because it's art. Like it is it, it's not just science, but there is science to it. And a part of it, I think, yeah, makes it makes just sense to to take advantage to take advantage of that because there yeah, there's no doubt that there are certain things we all like or don't like, or at least most of us. Totally. hundred yeah. percent. Interesting. Um, so cool. yeah, let's let's jump into your chain, man. Awesome. So um, it's a some of it is similar, some is a little different. So I start with something that does nothing sonically, but I have to have it there, and that is a VU meter. I have that open from the beginning of the mix till the end. It's always open in some corner of my screen. I always watch that, basically, especially when I built my initial rough mix balance panning and, and just volume balance. So I know a starting point, and I know how hard I want to hit my mix bus as a starting point. And then during the mix, I try hitting it harder or not so hard to see to find the sweet spot for the song. But I have that VU meter open because the VU meter is the easiest tool for me to 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 accomplish that. I could look at the channel meter or I don't know, but I I want to have something at the beginning of the chain, and the VU meter is is fast enough, but also slow enough for me to like I don't know. It's just how I how I like things to what I like things to look. It's similar to the VU meters on. You know why there are view meters on analog consoles. It's for that reason um, they give right. you gr a good, um, yeah, reference. So that's the first thing. Then um, the second one is a dangerous Bax EQ. This is a, a plugin by plugin, not the hardware. It's the plugin by plugin alliance, and I use that for the filters primarily. I just like how the filter sounds. So I, my default is it's it's, it's set to twenty four hertz um, low cut and to 70, 70 
Natin, 70 kilohertz with a high cut. This is way above what we can hear as humans. But honestly, uh -huh. call me crazy, but I believe I hear this filter. It's probably so, like, such a gentle um, slope or whatever that it goes down and makes the very top end a little smoother. I don't know what it is, but I just like it. Maybe it's a face thing. Cool. I don't, I don't I mean, know. I'm sure it's there for a reason. Yeah. So that's my default. And sometimes I pull that down to... Uh, there's 28 or 18 or like that's the lowest I would go. But like I play around with the top end filter there depending on the material that I'm mixing. And I also play around with the low cut. Sometimes I set it to 18 or sometimes 30. But usually 24 is my default and it works for a lot of things. So that's just my filter that I use there. Sometimes I don't use it at all. But honestly, most mixes need a little bit of filtering. At least I like to do that on the mix bus. So that's the first thing. If I feel like after my initial rough mix that every, really everything is a bit dark or everything is a bit um, bright or whatever, um, depending on the room that it's tracked in or something like that. I might use the backs also to just gently brighten it up or darken it uh, because these filter, uh, the, these um, backs EQs are really, really musical and gentle and you can like add 3 dB and without it sounding like you added 3 dB, it just opens up the top and a little bit makes things a little brighter or a little darker. It's like my, my initial sort of recalibrating how everything sort of yeah. sounds. That's that's why, why that is there. So the next thing is my actual mix bus, which can be, so what I what I call my actual mix bus because I have that in hardware version and I have a software version of that. So that means it's, the first thing is a color tool and the hardware is two Neve 1073s with transformers in them where I, I, I go into the line inputs. I drive the transformers a little bit to get a little bit of color and vibe. It makes the low end a little bit tighter to me at least. And um, from there, I go into my mix bus compressor, which is also hardware. It's an SSL style um, mix bus compressor, an Allen Smart. Um, and then I go back into nice. Cubase. And uh, if I do it in the box, which I sometimes do, I not always mix through the hardware chain. Um, it's the same thing. It's uh, a 1073 plugin where I lose the, the from by Plugin Alliance, where you can just use the line setting also and drive it a little bit. And uh, and after that comes the SSL native uh, bus compressor by SSL, the plugin. So it's the same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I have a couple more options, but this is just my go-to. Sometimes the townhouse is also something I, I like to use, like you do. The townhouse, I don't know how you feel about that, Malcolm. The townhouse is just sometimes a little too subtle for me, too gentle almost. I don't know, yeah. maybe that's just me, but I feel like, I, I don't know, I like a little bit of a pump and the townhouse is just... Very subtle. Sometimes you can bypass, you can you compress 304 dB and then you bypass it and you really have to listen if it's doing anything, at least to me, depending on the settings, of course. But I like a little bit of a more grabby SSL compressor sometimes. So Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually do find it very grabby, but only once you start ramping up the attack speed, of course. Yeah, that's um, it. And I like to use it with the 30 it is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're totally right. That's the reason. I like to use it with the 30 milliseconds attack. If you make it shorter, it's very grabby. And yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so that, there's that. Oh, I forgot one thing. Before I hit my mix bus, I actually use a limiter, but not for mastering, not for loudness. But I mm -hmm. have a Pro L uh, instance there, and a FabFilter Pro L2 instance, to just like really grab the upper, I don't know, half dB or one dB maybe. And I do that because I want to grab the occasional loud snare hit or loud transient so that my mix bus compressor sees, quote unquote, sees a more even level and can like react and, and, and groove and pump in a more consistent way. So it, when there's the occasional loud kick drum or snare drum, the bus compressor doesn't um, react to that and, and, and suddenly duck a uh, dB more or two dB more. So I like right. to, like, yeah, you have to be very careful with that. It's really just half a dB or a dB. It's just to control what's going into my bus compressor. Um, yeah. So that is followed then by my, my saturation and my bus compressor. And then that's that's actually basically it. Everything else is totally optional. I might add another EQ, a pull tech or a Mac um, EQ plugin to, if I really feel like, again, after my initial balancing is done, I introduce my mix bus. And if I really feel like that things are, for whatever reason, that the frequency balance overall is wrong, I add some top end. Or if I really like want the type of top end that the pull tech, for example, gives me or the Mac EQ gives me, sometimes there's nothing wrong with the mix, but I just think that, for the overall mix, it would be great to just have that type of sound or character to it. Right. Then I apply a little bit of top end similar to what you described. You just like the sheen basically and you like to add a little bit of top end in general. I like to do that as well sometimes. I just use a Pultec or a Mac um, EQ for that usually. And then, uh, yeah, and that's that's basically it. Um, 
at the end there is a limiter, but I don't mix into it. I it's completely off all the time. And then when I'm done mixing, I just turn it on, bring up the volume so that I can compare it to other things. But I only do two or three dB maybe on that limiter. Limiter, and this actually gets me to a pretty competitive loudness already because I mix in a very loud way. So my, my un, unmastered mix is already really dense usually and really loud. So just a, a little bit of limiting at the end gives me plenty of volume. Yeah, and that's it. So yeah. sum it up, meter, filtering, and basic tone shaping, saturation, 1 dB of limiting or so to control it, then the mix bus um, compressor, and then maybe in a, another uh, EQ, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's funny because like we we've given out these these are constants, but I mean I could open up a mix that would have twice as much or <laughs> yeah. half as as little, right? Um, Absolutely, it really does go all over the place. Like we kind of both left out color plugins, like the tape plugins and stuff that we mentioned earlier, or yeah. maybe that was last episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah. and and those do come into play, but um, but it is like a tool of like oh, I want like a softer transient and low end top. Here's my J thirty seven waves. Yes. plug-in kind of thing, and I know that it gives me that, um, and sometimes I think I want that, I throw it on, and it's not right, but it, it, there's all these little color plugins that can come into play, too. Sometimes I'll throw on, like, a, a, um, like a multiband saturator on on the, the like mix yeah. bus. That's very rare, but it's possible, right? I guess what I'm saying is that there's no real rules. As you can see, there's a constant theme of, of uh, like, a sonic EQ and compression shaping happening here. But really, you can do whatever you need to do to get the job done. Um, yes. But we just want you to be careful and uh, to know that there's often a solution that could happen earlier in the mix than at this stage. Yes, for sure. And also, be, you said um, the color the plugins that can that uh, we sometimes use, or you, you we've been talking about the AI plugins. I use those too, but. That I need to add one more thing. I use a lot of, and we often said that, I use a lot of buses. And on to the right, on my when I look at my mix window, pinned to the right and always there are my main sort of buses that all feed into the mix bus. And that means I have a drum bus, a bass bus, a rhythm bus, a lead bus, and a vocal bus. And a mm. lot of, like that, you could actually consider that bus processing too, what I do there. Because if I use Golfos or Sooth or something like that, I that's just me. I typically don't do that on the overall mix bus, but if I find the guitars to be a little harsh overall, I might add soothe on the guitar bus. Or if right. I think, um, same thing for the drums, if I feel like there's an overall harshness, I might go into and, and look for, like, if it's in the overheads of the rooms or whatever, but I might just put soothe on the drum bus sometimes. Or um, if I feel like the vocals are too sibilant and I have a lot of vocal tracks and backings and, and stacks and whatnot, I might just throw a, a de on the vocal bus or Soothe or Spiff or anything like that. Um, and same with the color tools. I, I might want the tape sound, but I might not apply it to the overall mix bus. I might just put it on the drum bus. And yeah. so so my actually my, my whole mix bus processing is sort of spread with the more heavy-handed stuff. It's spread across my, my buses, my groups. And then the more subtle stuff is happening on the actual mix bus. So... There's, I use these things too, but I just, I don't know, For I use them, yeah, on, on individual groups rather than the mix bus most of the time. But yeah, there's no rule. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's like, we're, we're talking about mix bus, but for Benny and I, we're, we're bus freaks. So we've got, <laughs> we got many mix buses, really. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever messed, that's like my final question for you, Malcolm. Have you ever messed with something like the rear bus? Do you know what that is? That concept that Andrew Sheps, for example, uses where he, he mixes bus. an entire... Um, so the the rear bus is on certain consoles, and I I think he I, may, I might be wrong here. If you like, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. If somebody listens and and you know what uh, what the correct way to explain this, well, please tell me. But like, I think it it uh, he had this concept from a Neve console that he was mixing on, like Andrew Sheps, and he's not the only one to use this, but he made it sort of popular. And that mix that Neve console had the mix bus, and it has a, a rear bus or back bus or something. I think it was called rear bus. So you could route all of the faders to the mix bus, and you could also route them to a second bus, and then you could blend mm. the two buses, basically. Right. So on right, that like second mix bus. bus, he added a pair of 1176s, or he still does that in the box, or he did for a long time. Maybe that has changed, but he did for a long time, even when he went into the box. So he he has a pair of 1176s there that are obviously not very transparent. They have a sound and very grabby and all of that. And whenever he feels like part of the mix need to be 
denser, need to move more, need to pump more, need more distortion, whatever, he would send that stuff to the rear bus and then feed that rear bus into his mix bus. So it's sort right. of an overall parallel processing thing, which I played around with it and I like the idea of it. And whenever he does it, it sounds great. For some reason, I ended up using it in like, I don't know, maybe two or three times it made it into the final mix, but I tried it like right. 50 <laughs> times or so. And it's one of those things where it totally works for Andrew Sheps. But if I, it's just, I listen, I hear things differently than he does. And, you know, it's it's a cool concept that I love in theory, but it just doesn't really work for me. But so I'm, I'm curious, have you ever tried something like that or like parallel bus uh, processing on the mix bus in general, something like that? I, I use the mix knob on my compressors often, like on, on the mix bus or on that instrumental bus I mentioned. Like if I'm, I'm pumping hard, it's definitely going to be in parallel mode. Um, so I guess I do just in a simpler manner. I do also have an outside drum bus. So I've got my main drum mm -hmm. bus and then I've got an outside stem where I can just sneak things past my, my primary drum compression um, if needed. And usually that doesn't get used, but I like just having it there because it's kind of like the perfect solution if mm -hmm. I need to have mm -hmm. uh, something mm -hmm. not getting pumped. So, so a little bit, I guess, but not, not in the way that he does. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, and one important thing about his rear bus, I found that to be really cool, the idea at least is that I think he doesn't send the kick and the bass to it. They go to the mix bus to give a consistent low end, but he sends, I think, the guitars, the vocals, and all of that, and maybe snare. I'm not sure about the rest of the drums. Maybe drums and bass completely bypass that, but for sure the guitars and vocals and synths and that stuff. And the reason is um, he sends all of that to the rear bus and then the rear bus back into the mix bus because it does a little bit of auto mixing for him because on that rear bus, when the vocals come in, they duck down the guitars a little bit and when mm. the vocals <laughs> uh, stop the guitars come up a little bit and if you blend that moving pumpy thing into the mix bus you get a little bit of auto mixing you know every time the vocal comes in the guitars get a little quieter and then the guitars come up a bit and it, it you know that's also part of what he does on the on the rear bus if I understand correctly that's which funny. I found it to be genius. a pretty cool idea actually but yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that is like, he's a genius, right? He's one of the yeah. best ever. There's no doubt. And and yeah, his work speaks for itself. Um, but at the same time, like it's almost like that kind of concept is exactly what we're telling our audience to steer clear of while you're yes. learning this. Um. <laughs> yeah. I'm not recommending this. I just wanted to ask you if you do anything crazy like that. I would not recommend yeah. doing any of that um, if uh, until you really know what you're doing. And uh, so yeah, it could go wrong so, so uh, easily. I just wanted to know yeah. if you do any anything crazy like that or something, or if you have some unconventional things. I mean, I'm sure I do, but nothing like that. And uh, but that's very cool. And again, yeah, it sounds like magic, and it kind of is, but it's a uh, only uh, it's a magic that only he knows how to use. <laughs> you know, yeah. so um, not that you can't try it, but don't expect it to just be a like a, a silver bullet. And and maybe you experiment and you find your own silver bullet. You know, like you'll yeah. you'll find things that work for you. That's kind of the fun of all of this. It's a very fun thing that we love to talk about as audio engineers because we all do it differently. So it's always exciting. Yeah, totally. And what's also interesting about this episode, I'm just I'm just now noticing this, is that we haven't mentioned, um, we haven't brought, we have even brought up multiband compression, for example. And I think that's interesting because I know for a fact that that's one, actually one of the most popular questions that I get when it comes to mix bus processing or mastering or making things loud. And people confuse these things all the time. But one of the most popular questions is actually how to use multiband compression or mix bus. Or people will even send me messages or when they apply for coaching calls and they fill out the questionnaire, they when I ask them what the number one thing is that they're struggling with, then they honestly, one of the most common answers to this is I don't know how to use multiband compression correctly, uh, especially mm. on the mix bus or mastering. And I listen to those mixes then and I'm like, that is not your main problem, <laughs> for sure not, you know, like, yeah. but people, for, for whatever reason, multiband compression seems to be a very interesting topic and people want to mess with it and people think you have to know how to use it or you have to use it on your mix bus. And I, I think it's interesting that you don't use it apparently or not often. I don't use it often, if at all. And I don't see a lot of other professionals use it on their mix buses really often. Uh, but for some reason, people think you have to use it or it's a crucial thing that they need to learn how to use so, yeah. Yeah, that is curious. We're going to have to do some thinking on why that is and make an episode about it, I think. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's in other genres more. I know that in the electronic um, genres, maybe there, I know that there's there's some things, there's this Ableton MOTT thing that's so popular that multiband um, 
preset thing and whatnot. But like, still, I, I don't think that multiband compression is something you should worry about, especially when you're starting out. And it's definitely not you not something you need on your mix bus in order to make it sound great or in order to make it loud or whatever. Uh, and it's so dangerous definitely. also. <laughs> 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 yeah all right yeah, you're you're right you're right uh so steer well i don't know don't steer clear i i really do want people to experiment and uh and have fun with it kind of thing but um i think we've laid out some best practices in, within these two episodes here um and, and giving you some inspiration on what we're kind of trying to do with it um that, like so having something to aim at is useful as well while you kind of embark and trying this out on your own audio yeah absolutely all right yeah, as always, let us know. If you have questions, um, put it in the Facebook community, send us an email, um, and we'll do our best to either answer them directly or make another episode. And yeah, if you have thoughts on the whole multiband topic, that could actually be an interesting um, topic. Like when, when let's, like maybe we could talk about when and if we use multiband processing and, or compression and, and how we use it. Um, if that's interesting to you, if that's something, and I, I think it is that a lot of people want to know more about, maybe we should do an episode. Anyway, let us know, totally. post it in the community, send us an email. We'll happy to, to answer your questions and we'll see you next week on another episode. I'd say for sure. All right. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.